Um, my name is Mike Goddard. I actually have two swimmers that swim for the Blazers on the Missouri side. And my background is currently on the, uh, I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Nutrition and Kinesiology at the University of Central Missouri in Lawrenceburg. And so in our department, we have a lot of different uh, majors and a lot of different concentrations. And one of those is nutrition. We prepare individuals to be registered dietitians. But we also have exercise science, exercise physiology. So we really look at the performance aspect when we talk about athletes and also kind of the, the, the uh, disease aspect. I'm not going to talk to you about the disease aspect today because you all care about the performance aspect. So we're kind of going to move from the psychological side of things that Rob just talked to you about. And now we're going to talk about really the science behind fuel that your kids take into their bodies and even your family in general takes into your body because a lot of what I'm going to talk about today really is based upon you as parents on your role of what your care, what your uh, kids take into their body. So let me kind of go ahead and get started here and give you a little overview of what we'll go into with this. So I'll give you a little bit of background on carbohydrates, because carbohydrates, what we find, are kind of our key ingredient that our bodies need to be able to perform. So I'm going to talk a fair amount today about carbohydrates and what those kind of are. I gave you a packet of information because there's no way in 30 minutes I can give you everything that you need to kind of take away from this. And so uh, refer back to that because I give you some specific examples in there of what are good snacks to take in, what are meals, what are examples of meals, and how many calories should that look like. And even on the end of my presentation, I also give you some web links to actually go to to help you and help your swimmer make healthier choices on what they need. So please take advantage of those. We'll get into pre-exercise feedings. So that really gets to what do you take in before you're gonna go and practice or before you actually go and compete? What do you do during exercise? What do you take in and should you take in anything or should it just be water? And then I'll also talk about carbohydrate intake after exercise and get into that protein intake as well after exercise. So, when we kind of look at, I'm going to use some science terms here, okay? So those of you who haven't had much science in a couple of years, we'll, we'll get you back up to speed, okay? Um, when I use the word muscle glycogen, let me define that for you. That's the carbohydrate that's stored in your muscles that we use. So we typically, for an average individual, will store somewhere around 2,000 to 2,500 calories of carbohydrate in our muscle. And we really rely upon that carbohydrate for moderate and intense physical activity that we engage in. We, we uh, and some of us have more than others, but we typically have somewhere between 70,000 to 80,000 calories of fat that we can utilize, more than we would ever need. But the carbohydrate is gonna be our key ingredient and then we have our protein, which is what our muscles and bones and skin and everything are made up of. And that's key because we break that down oftentimes when we exercise. And we don't want to have a breakdown of that. We want to have what we call catabolism, which means the breakdown of something. Instead, we would prefer to have anabolism. Everyone's heard of anabolic steroids, right? We're not going to give any of our athletes that. But the anabolism would be the building up of that. So we want to be cognizant of that protein as well. But what we do know about the, about the carbohydrate that's stored in the muscle and exhaustive exercise, and most of your swimmers are engaging in exhaustive exercise every time they go to practice, day after day after day after day. How many of your kids practice five plus days a week? How many are six plus days a week? How many are four? Three, two, yeah, okay, so most of you are three days or more a week, and that's a lot, especially for those younger athletes as well. Here's what we know. This is time to exhaustion. We call this, okay, here's your science, okay, we call this our y-axis, okay? And, and this is our initial muscle glycogen. How much do we have stored in the muscle before we engage in any type of activity? How much carbohydrate is there? And what we find out with this is that the initial muscle glycogen storage, how much we initially have in there, is key in terms of how long we can perform at a high level. 
So guess what? This is what I always tell my students when I'm lecturing. When I say guess what, your response always has to be what? Okay. So guess what? What? Okay. You have to take in carbohydrate in your diet to have this high muscle glycogen level. So if you don't take in adequate carbohydrate in your diet, there's no way that you're going to be able to perform at as high a level as what you would like to. Because if that two hour and a half, two hour practice is going on, you're thinking, well, 2,000 calories, 2,000 calories that we have stored in our muscle if you take in adequate dietary amounts of that carbohydrate. What we find with high school and college athletes in general, and this translates down to youth athletics as well, is that nearly 90% of those individuals are in caloric deficit. That they expend more than what they take in, and most times it's the carbohydrate that they're in deficit in. Oftentimes as Americans we take plenty of fat into our diet, but not enough of those other good fuel sources. And that primary fuel source, I really want to hammer this home today, that primary fuel source for athletes has to be the carbohydrate. You'll see these fad diets that are out there, go ahead and move that. You'll see these fad diets that are out there, that say, well, if you want to lose weight, you need to cut carbohydrates out of, out of your diet. Folks, for every molecule that we have of carbohydrate, there's four water molecules that are attached to it. If you want to lose weight quickly, cut carbohydrate out of your diet. No question, you will lose significant amount of weight within the first week or two. But it's all water weight. There's no change in the composition of your body. There's no change in body composition with that. And you'll feel very lethargic, fatigued, and not be able to engage in exercise. So we want to make sure that we do it the right way. If we want a modification in someone's body composition, if we want a lower percent body fat is what I'm saying, then just cutting carbohydrate out of your diet is never going to accomplish that. We need that fuel for energy. All right, this is busy, right? You're thinking, wow, well, I'm not really sure what's going on with this one. Blood glucose, blood sugar, okay? Blood sugar levels that you actually have are what I'm looking at. And this is time in minutes down here. What I'm getting at with this is if you were to have a sugar feeding right here, 45 minutes before you engage in exercise, okay? If you were just to take in whatever, sugar, carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates are what we call sugar. And you went ahead and look at this, um, you see this pre-exercise sugar feeding, that green line? You see how our blood sugar levels spike way up? And then zero point is when you start exercise. What happens to that sugar level? Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar level, is anything 60 or below. If you ever eaten a big, uh, nice, nice lunch, right, and you go back to work, and what happens around 1.32 o'clock? It's because your blood sugar levels crashed right down to here, and you're very lethargic. So let me ask you this. How do you think your kids will perform at that meet if you give them this nice, sugary snack 45 minutes before their race? You ever seen those kids up on the block? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's tough to compete really well if you feel like that. So what we would rather do is to have no sugar 45 minutes. If you're going to give them a snack, give them that snack an hour and a half to two hours before. And then their body can metabolize that. And then the spikes that are going to take place are going to even out. This becomes more important even with practice because practice is for a prolonged period of time. Now here's the way our body works though. If you were going to take in some sugar and it was around 10 minutes before, you wouldn't see this dip take place. Because there's other ways that our body can take that sugar. Because really all our body wants to do is it wants to take that sugar and get it into the cells, get it into the muscle cells and use it as energy. That's what we want to do. And so during exercise, hear me when I say this, go ahead and move the next one, Greg. During exercise, we want to make sure that we take in some of that carbohydrate 
during that prolonged exercise so that we spare the utilization of that carbohydrate that's stored in the muscle. So if your kids are practicing for an hour and a half, two hours in duration, especially if in there in there's those gold, senior two, senior one types of groups where it's very intense and they're moving from one set to another and they're, they're working hard for that hour and a half, two hours. Taking in some supplemental carbohydrate, Gatorade, Powerade, mixing up your own little solution, whatever it might be, is important for them to maintain that intensity level across that hour and a half, two hour period of time. Does that make sense? This one, we're looking again, everyone knows what glycogen is right now, right? How important that is, stored within the muscle. We also have some stored in the liver, but we're really concerned with the muscle right now. And exercise time in minutes. Pretty linear here. The more muscle glycogen that you have stored, right? The more muscle glycogen we have stored, the better off we're going to be. But what we do know is we use it as the duration of that exercise goes on. So what we're seeing here is from zero, we start off a little over 125. And then by that two hour period of time, we're getting depleted in that. So hear me with this. If we take in some carbohydrate during this two hour period of time, what do you think is going to happen to this graph? It's going to level off a bit more. We're not going to see this big decline. Research has shown us over the years that if we take in this supplemental carbohydrates like Gatorade, Powerade, okay, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, during that prolonged period of exercise, performance will be higher. No question about it, you'll perform better. So at the end of practice, coaches, right, Henry won't have to be yelling at his swimmers, not that he ever does. CJ won't have to be getting on. Come on, guys, let's go. This is our main set. You guys aren't doing what you need to be doing. Well, oftentimes, they might be trying, but it just might not be translating into the effort in which the coaches are looking for. And a lot of that we can take care of nutrition-wise very easily during that. So, what we know during carbohydrate during exercise, the majority of studies to show that carbohydrate ingestion during exercise improved performance provides about 25 to 60 grams per hour. So, think about this. Everyone, when you look at, look at those food labels, really take a minute to look at those food labels on drinks, on whatever it might be, and it'll tell you exactly how many grams there are of carbohydrate in there. And I'm talking grams per hour, so 25 grams per hour. And I'll get to this in a, in a future slide here in just a minute, but for every gram of carbohydrate, there's four calories. We call them kcals because that's the more technical term for it. But for every gram of carbohydrate, there's four calories. So when we talk about 25 grams, we're only talking about how many calories? 100. That's not that many calories when you're exercising. You're expending far more than what you're going to be taking in with that. So we're not talking about a lot of calories with that. So the recommendation from an exercise physiologist viewpoint, which is me, uh, is to ingest around 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per, per hour for exercise lasting longer than one to two hours. So that's your practices, folks. So think about if you're able to send in your swimmer to swim practice with water, you have to stay hydrated, and you're getting some of that water, some of that fluid, obviously, if you're taking in a Gatorade or something, but along with something else. Hydration is so key. Oftentimes, our swimmers don't drink enough at practice. They don't drink enough at meets. Think about the environmental conditions on a pool deck. Hot, humid. They're sweating, and they don't know that they're sweating because they're in water. And so it's tough for them to stay hydrated. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. but. It's key that they have water and they have that Gatorade or Powerade or whatever else. Okay. Here's our water balance. I had to put this in. I know I'm talking about nutrition, but water is nutrition. How much of our body is made up of water? About two-thirds. About 66% of our body is water. Water weight. It's Critically important for thermal regulation, how our body regulates its temperature, and we find it's critically important for blood flow distribution to be able to get where it needs to get as well. So, 
Metabolic water production increases as body heat increases. So as you work harder, there is a production of water through some of our metabolic cycles. Water loss increases during exercise due to sweating. And a lot of times our swimmers don't even know that they are sweating. And blood flow to the kidneys decreases to prevent dehydration. We don't want to become dehydrated because then blood flow decreases to some of our vital organs, which could then negatively impact an individual long term. So if dehydration exceeds about 2% of body weight, physical performance is impaired. You see a decrease in performance. So if your athlete weighs 100 pounds and they lose 2 pounds during practice, their performance will decrease significantly. 2 pounds is not much. I've done studies before on athletes where we weigh them before and after practice, and they'll lose 8 to 12 pounds in 2 hours if they don't take in fluid. It is tough to keep up with what you need. All of you, at one point in time, have exercised and felt thirsty, yes? Your thirst mechanism is 30 minutes behind what your body's needs are. I always tell athletes that are engaged in prolonged type of physical activity, once you're thirsty, it's too late. You can't catch up. So instead of trying to catch up, the key is that every 10, 15 minutes take in that fluid during that activity that might last, like a practice that might last about two hours in duration, because you can't catch up afterwards. And there will be a, there will be a detriment in performance, no question about it. So muscle glycogen loading may delay the onset of fatigue. So what that means is if you take in adequate amounts of carbohydrate into your diet, most likely you won't get as tired as quickly because you have that fuel that's so critically important for performance and during physical activity that you're going to be able to engage in it longer and at a more intense level. Maintaining normal blood glucose levels may allow the muscles to obtain more energy from blood glucose, sparing liver and muscle glycogen. Here's what that means. When you're exercising, if you take in that Gatorade, Powerade, whatever it might be, you're going to spare the utilization of that carbohydrate in the muscles, and as a result, you're going to be able to call upon that later on during that practice or that competition and be able to have better performance as a result. Activities over one hour can be enhanced when carbohydrate is consumed within five minutes of, right? We don't want that spike in that blood glucose. Don't do it 45 minutes before. But if you do it around five to 10 minutes before or during, your body won't get that spike because it's going to say, oh, I'm going to be exercising. You're smart, but your body's not quite as smart as you. If you're thinking, I'm going to exercise in 45 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and have this carbohydrate drink right now. Well, your body doesn't know that you're going to be exercising in 45 minutes. But if you take it in during, your body already knows that it's exercising. And it can use other mechanisms to get that carbohydrate into the muscle and use it. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Yes, because we can metabolize it through the gut and actually have it get into the bloodstream and then go from our hormone that we use to get the, the glucose or the sugar from the blood into the cells is insulin. So all of you probably heard is that they have insulin. So that's our hormone that we can use. So what happens is our pancreas, when we have this a large amount of sugar, our pancreas releases a bunch of insulin and it overcompensates on how much insulin it releases. It pulls too much of that carbohydrate into the cell and not as much as in the blood. And as a result, we start to have this dip. So if we take it in right before, we don't have this huge release of insulin, and therefore we don't get this big dip that happens. That's why taking it right before is OK, and taking it 45 minutes before. What we, have, what we see that happens after two hours, is you can add that dip and it comes back up to a normal level in time within that two hours. Good question. This was an individual. Uh, where I got my PhD was, was at Ball State University with Dave Costell. Dave Costell was, was, is a renowned exercise physiologist. He's now retired. But he has done almost all of the swim research that's out there in the literature. And so we did a lot of swim-based research when I was there. And this was a guy who swam for 24 hours straight. 
that's what he kind of looked at. We were getting blood draws on it and everything on him during that time and doing everything. Now, he would stop and eat a little bit during and, and take little rest breaks, but in essence, he went for 24 hours in straight with swimming, and we looked at what happens to the muscle glycogen. Oh, and he got muscle biopsies and stuff along the way, too, which was good for him. <laughs> he was a student there, so you just abuse your own, right? So it's all good. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about after exercise now with this. Here's what we know, okay? This slide's a little busy, but you're going to get the point of it really, really quick. Muscle glycogen, okay? We're all cool with that term now, right? Here's our time, but now it's in hours. Zero, 12 hours, 24, 36, 48, all the way up to 72. Each one of these green boxes here, this represents that two-hour practice, okay? So here's our two-hour training balance, or that two-hour practice. So, we start off, okay, we have low carbohydrate diet, which are the open circles, and the high carbohydrate diet are the closed circles, okay? So we start off the same, around 120 of that carbohydrate stored in the muscle, okay? So you go to your first practice and you drop down. Well, that's fine, right? You're using it because you just practiced. The person who takes in a high amount of carbohydrate in their diet, we're looking at 60% or so, recovers quite nicely. Not all the way up to where they started with, but within 24 hours, when that next practice session hits, they're right, they're, they're, they're okay. Look at the person who didn't take in as much carbohydrate, the low carbohydrate. They didn't see much improvement from where they were at the end of practice, and now they're here. And now we do another two-hour bout of exercise. And look at where they're at here. Again, not much of an improvement. Look at where the high-carbohydrate diet is. You see how they're still doing okay. And then we hit that third day in a row of practice, and now they're nearly depleted. Nearly nothing. Right? This is zero. How do you think their performance is going to be in practice? How do you think they're going to feel? We call this our staircase effect. You've got to see how it staircases down. If you don't take in enough into your diet, within 72 hours, you're going to be nearly depleted if you're practicing day after day after day. Whereas if you take in adequate amounts, and especially as we're going to get into it here in just a second, if you replenish as quickly as you can after practice, the benefits that you're going to see long term are tremendous as it relates to performance. Because if you can't practice adequately, folks, there's no way that you're going to get the training effects that you're going to want to be able to perform during competition, right? It's just impossible. You know, just like, just like Rob, you know, I played two sports in college. And as I started to go through my undergraduate program, I started to say, wow, man, I could have been a lot smarter in high school if I would have just known a little bit. And then as, as I went through and got my master's degree, I learned how, how little I knew even when I was playing sports in college. And then when I got my PhD, I learned how even less I knew back then. But a little bit of knowledge here, folks, you can go a long way with just helping your kids um, feel better. Just feel better. You would be amazed at how much that can translate into academics at school and everything else. Okay. It looks like in this graph that even breaks, you reset your body, right? As far as training. That's right. And you know, and those breaks really are what are you fueling your body with during those breaks that are critically important. But definitely, if you did take a day off and you continued to feed your body during that day off, you would see even a higher increase or a result of that. All right, then here's our diet composition. This is very general, but this is what I would suggest that you would in general follow with your kids. About 60% carbohydrates. I told you, one gram of carbohydrate equals around four calories. Okay, that's what that is underneath. About 25% should come from fat, and less than 10% of that should come, should come from saturated fat. All these are on every single food label. It'll tell you exactly what, how many grams of these carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then for protein, we're looking at about 15 grams. And again, one gram of protein equals four K counts. Okay, look at how much fat equals though. It's much more calorically dense, fat is, than is carbohydrate or protein. Carbohydrate and protein are the same amount of calories per gram, whereas fat is more than double. So you have to watch that amount of fat 
because it is that much more calorically dense. And then when we look at protein, oftentimes in the literature, what you'll see in protein is you'll say, well, how much do I really need to take it? Because some people get into these really, really high protein diets, and that's not necessarily appropriate, but having enough is critical for performance. The RDA, the recommended dietary allowance of protein, is 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So if you took how much you were in kilograms, right, whatever your weight was in kilograms, and so most, most of us know pounds, so you take your weight in pounds divided by 2.2, that gives you kilograms, and then you take that kilograms and you just multiply by that 0.8, it would tell you what that recommended dietary allowance. What we know from research that I've done, and I've done with others, is that for athletes, they actually need between 1.4 and 1.8 grams per kilogram body weight of protein. Because there's more of a breakdown of that protein when we exercise. You can do math on a 100 pound kid, Yeah, so we can do that. Yeah, I told you there was going to be some science, and maybe a little math, you know, and those things. So, for a 100, uh, for a 100 pound kid, so a 100 pound kid would be about uh, 48 kilograms, 45 kilograms, something like that. All we would do is take that 45 kilograms and multiply it by 1.4 or 1.8. So let's say that they were 50 kilograms. So we would take that 50, multiply it by 1.4 or 1.8, that would tell you how many grams of protein they would need per day. Does that make sense? 81. Huh? 81. 81. There we go. 81 grams of carbohydrate of, of protein per day. 81 grams. So 81 times 4 is about 320-ish. That's not that many calories of protein, right? I mean, so we're not talking about an excessive amount. But because of that breakdown, we will need a little bit more of that protein. And that's why we go beyond what that RDA is for individuals. Okay. All right. Here's where it comes down to the importance of the timing of what you're taking into your body. Here's your rinse. Okay. Muscle glycogen still. I mean, how much do we have stored? And then here's are the days afterwards. So let's say someone ran a marathon. We'll just use an extreme example here. After pre in the green, we can see that here's what they're left with with muscle glycogen after that race. They're, they're just depleted. We call this a practice or a marathon, whatever, but they're depleted. What we see, you see that pink line that goes up? That's called glycogen <coughs> synthase. That's an enzyme that gets that carbohydrate into the cell to restore the amount of carbohydrate that we just lost. It's at its highest peak immediately after exercise. And so what we want to do is we want to take advantage of that enzyme that pulls that carbohydrate into the muscle. We want to take advantage of that enzyme and take in that carbohydrate or eat that carbohydrate as soon as we can after we're done with exercise. And the timing of this, folks, is really critical because we only have about a 45 minute to an hour window where our body has this high enzyme level to allow for us to pull that in so that we don't see that staircase effect take place day after day after day. So you must consume recovery calories within 45 minutes to see optimal benefits. So when your kids get done from practice or done with a meat, taking in that carbohydrate and that protein source immediately is important. How many here are your kids in a carpool? <laughs> okay. How many of you live, once your kid gets out of the water, okay, gets out of the water to when you get home is 45 minutes or more, right? And so we, we probably took care of two-thirds of you right now. So giving them that recovery meal or drink when they get home might not be effective, is what I'm telling you, because that time, that window has already passed. 
because we find that after that hour time point, benefits decrease substantially in terms of that. And that's what we're looking at with this graph. Glycogen synthesis, the ability to kind of get that carbohydrate in there, zero to 120 minutes of recovery compared to 120 to 240. We see that the fed folks do very well, the non-fed folks, not so good. And e even if we don't have we don't have it within, here we did it even two hours, but what we know is that that 45 minutes is optimal. We find that, you know what? You might as well have not even fed them. <laughs> right? Save your money. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, are you when you're saying to get it to them within that 45 minutes? Are we talking about giving them a snack kind of thing? Or I'm going to give you some specific examples in just a second. Okay. How's I that? Can't wait. And then if you have any more questions, I'll answer. I knew you could tell me. <laughs> okay. Type of carbohydrate ingestion on muscle glycogen restoration. You understand what I mean by this now, right? We got a lot of sciencey terms here. But I didn't want you to walk out of here and feel like you couldn't relive some of those days of, in the science class, okay? So, type of carbohydrate ingestion. What do you take into your body? Immediate post-exercise on restoring that carbohydrate into the muscle. That's all we say with this. Take this in, get it into the muscle. Here's what we know. This is a study we did a couple of years ago. Take carbohydrate alone, we do pretty good. Take protein alone, not so good. Take carbohydrate and protein together, really good. So here's what we know, is that taking in just carbohydrate is great post-exercise, but if you can add a little protein to that recovery drink, even better in terms of getting that into the muscle. Questions on that, does that make sense? Okay, go ahead. Hey, here's one thing you can do. This is a very simplistic thing that you could do. Chocolate milk. What we want, okay? We, okay? As a scientist, what I would like to see is I'd like to see a three to one ratio between carbohydrate and protein. That's what I mean by this. Could add about four to five grams to get the carbohydrate protein ratio drink to 3.1. We'd like it to be the amount of carbohydrate that we have, grams of carbohydrate, compared to the grams that we have of protein, about three to one. That's pretty close yeah. to what this, I just pulled up Nestle Quick. I'm not, they don't pay me anything. I'm not sponsored by Nestle Quick or anything. But what we see is that if we just look all along with me here, it says serving size, one cup. Servings per container, about two. So take whatever you see here listed below and multiply it by two. So what we see here, calories, we built around 300 calories. That's not bad. That's not a bad uh, caloric uh, <coughs> amount of recovery. We look at the total amount of carbohydrate, about 29 grams. Hey, for simplicity's sake, let's just call that 30. So we're looking about 60 grams of carbohydrate. And we're looking around 16 grams of protein. Now, I'd like that protein to be closer to 20, right? Because I, if I want that 3 to 1 ratio. And that's why I say, hey, you could add around 4 to 5 grams of protein to get yourself to that 3 to 1 ratio. But I wouldn't necessarily go through an, an extreme amount of effort to do that because this will work just fine, this type of recovery. Now, here's what you get into. Number one. Do, some people do not want to take in a dairy product after they exercise because it's just appalling to them to take in milk or something like that right after they exercise. If your kid's not going to be able to drink it and they're just going to let it sit there and not really finish it, then don't waste your money. Right? Find something that they will kind of tolerate. What you find with a lot of these recovery drinks, none of them really taste good. And my saying in my house with my two boys is, Grant, what do I say? I say, choke it down. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't taste good. Choke it down. It'll be okay. Just chug it. Just get it done. Chocolate milk will work. It is a pretty good way to do it. Okay? 
But you've got to get it to them right away, and, and you've got to keep milk cold the last time I checked. So it is perishable. So you have to, you have, to have a way to get it to them, okay? I'm going to give you some other ways. Go ahead. Here. Yes. Hey, here's the thing, okay? There is these big, big talks nationally, internationally about the amount of sugar. Sugar is glucose. Sugar is the simplest form of carbohydrate that we have in our body. Sugar is the easiest thing that actually gets incorporated into the cell. What your body does with the complex carbohydrates is they break them down to glucose and fructose, which are two simple sugars. And those sugars that are in these drinks are glucose and fructose. So eventually your body's just going to break those down and get them to their simplest forms to then go into the cell. If you're just taking sugar, sugar, sugar throughout the day, those are calories. And you will get spikes in, in terms of your insulin spikes and your glucose spikes, and it will kind of, you'll just be all over the place the whole day. So I'm, te I'm telling you, for recovery purposes, carbohydrate is carbohydrate, and it'll work just fine. And don't worry about the sugar part of it. Honestly, don't, because it's just the simplest form of carbohydrate, and it's, it's carbohydrate. And it'll work just fine. Here's another product that's out there. It's, it's uh, made by Gatorade, and it's a protein recovery shake. And usually, it's hard to find. I will tell you this. But it comes in chocolate and vanilla, and it breaks down to about 45 grams of carbohydrate, 20 grams of protein, about one gram of fat, about 207 calories. They sell it in high V. They come in packs of four, and they're $8 for a pack of four. They're $2 a piece. They're not cheap. But... They don't have to be refrigerated, but they taste much better colder than warmer, right? Yeah, chocolate's better. Too. Chocolate's better. <laughs> no, vanilla's better. <laughs> my, my kids are guinea pigs for everything, right? So this is an option. It's convenience. It's prepackaged. There's nothing to mix up, but there's a cost associated with it. Okay, go ahead. Here's a product. If you're worried about sugars, this has no sugar in it. It's all based upon complex carbohydrate. There's no dyes in it. The color that you get from this looks like a toxic pink color, but it's from beet juice is the coloring in it, so it's not a dye. This is just carbohydrate. For one scoop, you get 25 grams of carbohydrate in it. So you'll probably have to give them probably two scoops of this. What you do with this, go ahead, Grant, is you mix it with some whey protein, and then you just put water in it. So when they get done, so that when they get done with practice, you can either have it in a container form or in a little baggie, and they can just put it into their water bottle, fill their water bottle up the fountain, shake it up and drink it. So your timing is taken care of in terms of that 45 minute window. This stuff, here's the thing, okay? You gotta pay for convenience in this country, right? Here's the thing. This probably will cost about $1.50 per serving, and this will cost you probably about 25 to 50 cents, so you're right at that $2 again. It's kinda, you know, it's, one of those things that you just kind of have to weigh as parents and as families on what works for you. We've tried this in our house as well. Uh, it's went okay, right? Fruit punch. With water, it tastes pretty good cold, um, and you can put it in like an orange Gatorade, and it kind of tastes like a cream chip. No. Not this. Don't put this in the Gatorade because yeah. this Gatorade takes the place of this. You would just put your whey protein into Gatorade and then shake that up. And that gives you a pretty good ratio as well. We've tried both. And I've tried it myself. Fruit punch and vanilla whey is not bad. I mean, it's, it's not that bad. The orange Gatorade with this isn't that bad. And I think, and I haven't tried it, but the fruit punch Gatorade, that color, you know, that red color one with this, probably would taste similar to what this tastes like as well. It's not bad. I have a question about the whey protein. Because um, we buy a bag of whey protein from Costco. Mm -hmm. I know there's different 
kinds of whey protein. Don't get don't get caught up in the types of whey protein. You can get it at Walmart, you can get it at GNC, you can get it at Costco. Most of it is pretty similar. What you need to look at is how much is each scoop. Because it can range anywhere from 15 to 30 grams for a scoop. Okay, that was my other question. Isn't there a maximum amount of protein that your body can take in at one time and actually metabolize? It's about like 30 grams. Usually. So, so that protein powder. Here's the thing, you know that you know that little math that we had to do a little while back? So that 1.4 to 1.8 grams? If your child weighs 35 kilograms, you don't need as much protein as the athlete who weighs 100 kilograms, right? So weigh that out in terms of how big is your child with that. But you're absolutely right. So that's why I tell you the key is the ratio of carbohydrate to protein, not necessarily the amount. So like for my youngest, who's 10, who weighs about 37 or 38 kilograms, then he doesn't need a 500 calorie recovery drink, right? He just doesn't, but that ratio would still be the same with that. Go ahead. These are some other convenience things that are out there that have pretty good nutritional value to them. They're easy things. If, you're, if your child, listen, liquids metabolize faster than solids through our gut. But if your child is just like, I am not drinking that, right? Give them one of these. Because they have carbohydrate and protein in them. It's not quite as much, but I will tell you, it's better than nothing. And if you can get that into them quickly in that time window, and it's easier for you as a family to just throw one of these bars into their bag, it's better than nothing. If the drink thing, either financially or practicality-wise, isn't going to work for your family, I get that. I really do. Find something that does work, and a lot of it's still going to be the convenience things. Try it. It's worth a shot to see what works with your family. And mix it up. We cycle through these things as a family because they'll get sick of a certain drink or something, and then we'll have to find something else that kind of works. Go ahead. All right, here's some resources for you in terms of good things for you to look at with diet stuff. I also have in those handouts a lot of other information for you because I wanted you to walk away with some practical things and approaches that you can take. There is a sheet that just talks about the importance of nutrition with swimmers. Please take a look at that one. There's one on dietary supplements because I get questions on that. There's one on the importance, this small one talks about the importance of hydration during meets and exercise. And then there's also some stuff in there related to some sample diets and some sample snacks and healthy snacks that you can use as well. Most of your kids, even if they're 10 and they're practicing five days a week, or four days a week or whatever, per day, folks, I'm sorry, they're going to be probably needing more than 2,000 calories a day, so your grocery bill will go up, right? I mean, you can probably, if you want to know what happens with a grocery bill with multiple kids who swim and varying ages, I imagine that you could talk and talk to the musters, right? They would be able to kind of tell you how that looks, right, over time. Uh, and I'm sure other of you, others of you can look at that as well. So the sample diets that I gave you are called higher calorie diets because oftentimes you're looking at 3,000 plus calorie diets for a lot of those kids because they spend sometimes around 1,000 calories in a practice, right? And then we, usually our bodies need about 12 to 1,800 calories just to do our normal daily function, not to mention any additional exercise, okay? This last one is just to kind of show you some recent success stories for our Blazers, for some folks that I've worked with. Uh, Ethan Brissett, who I started to uh, kind of work with a little bit in the fall, we modified his diet. We kind of did a 180 with his diet and simply just took what he was not taking in for carbohydrate and got him up to that 60%, got him doing some post-exercise recovery drinks, and he's a pretty good test in terms of not only his performance, which he did win the 200 IM for the Missouri uh, High School Championships last weekend, but also the testament of he will tell you just how good he feels on a day-to-day -day basis, 
how he just feels like he has more energy in school and awake and just feeling good because he has the energy that his body needs throughout the day and then through practice as well. And then um, my own little one as well, we've kind of really stayed, stayed pretty regimented uh, with what we do in terms of nutrition and diet and stuff and he was able to have a little success this past summer as well. Um, so it, it works, folks. It works. It's not, I know I gave you a lot of science. It's really not rocket science. Get in that 60% of carbohydrate. Get in some sort of post-recovery after exercise. And I guarantee you, you'll see some benefits. Thanks. I know it went longer today than what you thought. But if you do have questions, you're more than happy to ask.